Now let's turn, friends, to the uh, portion we read, seeking the anointing of the Spirit of God. We're going to look at this story we know as the road to Emmaus experience, verse 13 of uh, the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. When uh, this famous incident took place, it was one in a series of appearances Jesus made in his resurrected form. Now, sometimes it states for us to whom he appeared, and sometimes it doesn't. Here is to two people, one named Cleopas, verse 18. And we're told something interesting in John chapter 19, when we read of Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Now, some commentators are of the opinion that uh, the second person mentioned here was this man's wife. And evidently, at least according to some of the commentators, Cleopas was the brother of Joseph, the earthly father of our Lord. And he was also evidently, again according to some of the commentators, he was a father to James and to Jude. But in any case, these two individuals are walking here from Jerusalem uh, to Emmaus, following the Lord's crucifixion. And Emmaus was more than likely their hometown. Now, uh, in terms of distance, the furlongs mentioned here works out at around about seven miles. Now, that would take perhaps an hour and a half, maybe even two, two hours, depending on the pace of their walk. And they're found in deep discussion they had much to talk about. As we know, verse 14, they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now, these two people, along with others, they had just witnessed the greatest miscarriage of justice this world has ever seen. Verse 14, they talked of all these things which had happened. They watched as men insulted, assaulted, lied, hated, and ultimately crucified the Holy Son of God. And they were witnessing all of that in an expression of the true nature of man's depravity. Little wonder Jesus <coughs> noted their sadness at the end of verse 17. Now, one can't help feeling some sympathy for the believers that lived in that time, indeed during the whole time that Jesus was on earth. Yes, he had to rebuke them here and elsewhere. He had to rebuke them for the lack of unbelief, for their Lack of for the lack of belief and for the lack of understanding and for the dullness of their minds. But did they not have a mountain of stuff to get around in their minds, to grasp a hold of intellectually and spiritually? They're here standing what turned out to be a crossroads of history the greatest crossroads of history ever. And they're trying to work out how to blend their Old Testament world with the new world that is now being introduced by the events that took place at Calvary. That wasn't an easy thing to work out, not for anyone. And events demonstrate that very clearly. Now, until recent times, I'm just going to mention this in the passing as a comment, 
partly because of its, of its significance. Until recent times, this unparalleled crossroads was marked in the history books of the Western world, at least, for the past 2,000 years with the designation of B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Latin Anno Domini, which means the year of the Lord, um, another way of putting after Christ. That was accepted for 2,000 years, or at least perhaps not 2,000 years, because I think it was in the 4th century that the, uh, what we call the Gregorian calendar was established. So, best part of 1,500 years, this was the designation recognized throughout the Western world. Nowadays, however, all these things are changing. These two people, they witnessed that hatred at Calvary, but that hatred is now sweeping across the entire Western world. And that world has become intolerant of any reference to Jesus Christ as of historical importance in this world. So they've insisted and have done so successfully eliminating BC and AD. Now, 99% of the time in serious writings and reportings and historical documents and such like, you will hear uh, the designation CE and um, what's the other one? BCE and CE before the common era and the common era. They don't want to hear the name of Christ. It's the common era. So much do they hate the very name of Jesus. Meanwhile, let's explore this fascinating story. Let's look first of all at the meeting between these three individuals. Verse 15. While they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You remember when, when Elijah first appeared on the scene of time in the book of Kings in chapter 17? He appears without not a word of introduction, not a word of explanation. We read in verse 1 of chapter 17 in 1 Kings, And Elijah the Tishbite said unto Ahab, No idea where the man came from. He just bursts onto the scene of time and starts to be, begins immediately to challenge that wicked king Ahab. Well, here Jesus appears somewhat mysteriously like Elijah. He came out of nowhere. He gives them no explanation. He makes no introduction of himself. Now they knew him well. They knew Christ very well. If these commentators are right, they would have known Christ all his, all his earthly life. Nevertheless, they said to him, verse 18, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known these things? Mark makes an intriguing comment on this incident. He doesn't go into any detail about it. He simply makes this reference. This is in Mark chapter 16. He appeared in another form to two of them. Now we believe he's referring to the road to Emmaus. What did he mean? In another form. Well, many commentators agree that he must have been comparing the form by which he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he appeared as a gardener. He doesn't appear here as a gardener. He appears evidently as something like a scribe. Uh, he's expounding the scriptures. That's the role that they would have expected a scribe to undertake. But whatever the form, that's not why they failed to recognize him. Verse 16, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. In other words, God prevented them for his own reasons 
from recognizing him. Now, to this day, God has, of course, that sovereign authority over every finite creature on the face of this earth. You know, we, have a, we have an interesting verse, which is very familiar to us. You hear it being raised in public prayer quite often, taken from John, from the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 17. And the, word, the verse is, In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Now, that's not talking merely about Christians. That's talking about every human being on the face of this earth. Every living creature lives, moves, and has its being in God. There is no life outside of God. Whether you're talking about a saint of God or a worm in the dust, the life comes from God. He's the only source of life. So he can hide from us or he can reveal to us anything he pleases. Anything he pleases. So here for his own reasons, he hid the identity of Jesus from these two people. Now it's worth noting, just a few days before this, they saw him being scourged they saw him being crowned with thorns. They saw him being crucified, nailed to the cross. Yet, there's evidently no sign of these wounds here. I'll comment more about that later on. Meanwhile, as they walked, they entered into this deep discussion on events at Calvary, verse 15, while they communed together and reasoned. Did you notice that word? And reasoned. It's a word that means they examined, they discussed, they questioned the meaning of those events they had just witnessed at Calvary. That's what you should be doing. That's what I should be doing. Exploring, probing, analyzing the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. In other words, what did the death of this man mean 2,000 years ago? What does the death of this man mean today? And even more important still, what does the death of Jesus Christ mean to me personally? In any case, as they walked along, this figure appeared alongside them. Verse 15, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And he noted their demeanor. And so he asked them, verse 17, what manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Isn't it great to know of all the places Jesus could have appeared in, at this juncture, of all the people he could have chosen to speak to, he came and spoke to two sad individuals. Isn't that encouraging for those who tend to have a melancholy spirit, for those who feel sad and cast down in their hearts and in their souls and in their minds? It is the delight of our Lord Jesus Christ to draw alongside us, to walk beside us in this world. What an encouragement. Well, here Cleopas explained their sadness to him. And he spoke of how they viewed the death of Jesus of Nazareth, indeed his life and his death, in verses 19, 20, and 21. So they tell Jesus that they understood him to have been a great prophet. Mighty, they said, in word and in deed, but also someone who was a victim of sheer cruelty. All of that was true. But then comes the flaw in their thinking. Verse 21. We trusted that it had been him 
or he which should have redeemed Israel. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? It's even the use in the language of salvation, redeeming Israel. That's the term the Bible uses in the salvation of sinners. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. Sadly, that's not what they meant. But rather, the redeeming of Israel from Roman occupation. So their idea of a Messiah was someone who would be a mixture of a spiritual and a political figure. Now, the weird thing is, and I hadn't thought about this, I was preparing this sermon. The weird thing is, there's a smidgen of truth in that. That our Lord Jesus Christ is predominantly a spiritual figure, but he also has a political dimension to him. When the gospel of redeeming grace is fully applied, when God's laws are governing society, there can be and there has been, as this nation of ours knows only too well, spiritual and political liberty. Isn't that true? For long enough, the United Kingdom demonstrated this to the world. We weren't just free spiritually under the sound of the gospel. We were free politically, free from dictators and despots living in the land of peace. Why? because of the influence of this man and his gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, what these people were expecting was a restoration of David's Old Testament kingdom. So they were way off the mark. That's not, my friends, what Messiah's kingdom was about. The Christian church over which the Lord Jesus is king and Lord, that is a spiritual kingdom, a global, multinational, multi-ethnic kingdom of born-again Christians. It's described in this way in Galatians 3, verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. These are the citizens of the kingdom of Messiah. So little wonder these two were sad. They were way off beam in their thinking. They didn't understand the cross and they didn't understand why Jesus had to die. And that's the saddest experience of all for men and women, young and old, in this world. Now, that's true even if they don't experience this sadness until the last moments of their lives in this world. Listen to these names. Voltaire, David Hume, Thomas Paine, Thomas Scott, Alistair Crowley, these names may or may not mean anything to you. But each one of these men was an avowed atheist life long. But they had something else in common, according to the biography written by their families. Each one of them confessed sadness and bitter regret on their deathbed for the way they lived. Well, of course, Cleopas and his friend, they weren't atheists, but nor did they understand the cross, my friends. And that's a fatal flaw in anybody's thinking. We've got to get our heads around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said to somebody else. This is recorded in Mark chapter 12. 
you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, had that man died there and then, there would have been little difference between him and that list of atheists I just gave you. Little difference. You see, my friends, we're either in the kingdom of Christ or we're out of it. There's no third way. There's no grey area. There's no middle of the road. No fence to sit on. We're either in the kingdom, in Christ, or we're out of the kingdom and out of Christ. Hence, the urgency of the gospel message. Today is the day of salvation. And you make sure that you take that on board in your own life. Let me move secondly to the reply Jesus gave in verse 25. O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus patiently listened to their tale of woe till they came to the bit about the empty tomb. They told him about the woman, verse 23, they found not the body. Then referring to the angels, verse 23 again, they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. But these were all facts, facts upon which he had spoken clearly when he was still alive on the earth. And he had told them he had to die. He had told them that he would rise again. But interestingly, his attitude now wasn't, I told you so. No, he was far too gracious for that. Instead, he refers them to the Old Testament. And in particular, to places where these things were predicted from the very beginning. Hence the rebuke. O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, he doesn't call them fools in the way that he himself forbids the use of that word in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. There, the word is a different word to here. The word he used there is the word from which we get the word moron. You are not to call anybody a moron, especially none of the Lord's people. Whereas the word used here is full in the sense that you lack knowledge you ought to have. You lack knowledge you ought to have. So he challenged that knowledge by this question. Verse 26. Ought not Christ, do you not know this? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, do you not understand that the entire mission of Messiah is based on suffering, death, and resurrection? The Sermon on the Mount, my friends, is without question the greatest written sermon ever preached. Without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest written sermon ever preached. Here, Jesus delivers the greatest unwritten sermon ever preached. The greatest unwritten sermon ever preached. Well, verse 27 beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have loved to be on the road to Emmaus that day? Wouldn't you have loved to have heard this prince of preachers? You know how the church has baptized Charles Spurgeon with that title. They call him the Prince of Preachers. No, here's the Prince of Preachers, the Lord Jesus Christ. And furthermore, how much we 
would have benefited if we had that sermon written down in the way that we've got the Sermon on the Mount written down for us. Oh, if we only had access to it, my friends. We haven't, but we can make certain assumptions based on the little information that we have. It states in verse 27, beginning at Moses. Oh, as we mentioned in the morning, Moses is the author of the first five books in the Bible. Now, surely we can suggest if he began preaching from the book of Genesis, Moses, surely he began with the first promise regarding himself, Genesis 3.15. Surely he expounded that text that the seed of the woman himself would come and bruise or crush the head of the serpent. I would suggest to you that was the first point in his sermon. Everything else in the Bible is the outworking of that promise. And can I suggest to you the second point in a sermon was probably and possibly the story of Abraham offering Isaac on Mount Moriah, which was again a faint type of his own sacrifice on Calvary. Can I suggest the third point in this unwritten sermon must have been about the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12. Another type of himself, which is confirmed to us in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Can I suggest the fourth point of this sermon would be Moses and the Exodus. Did he not mention this when he took Moses from heaven to appear beside him on the Mount of Transfiguration? And Luke tells us that he spoke about the Exodus. I could even suggest to you what his fifth point would have been. The brazen serpent, which we looked at not long ago in the series we did on Moses, in Numbers 21. Doesn't he refer himself to the brazen serpent in John chapter 3? And he would have worked his way through the Old Testament, choosing relevant subsequent messianic portions all the way from Joshua to Malachi. And we can only imagine, my friends, the thrill Cleopas and his partner felt when they came to Psalm 22. When they came to, when he came to Isaiah 53. Oh, how, the must, how their hearts must have been uplifted hearing Jesus preaching from those portions of Scripture. You know, preachers like myself and men who are far better than me at preaching, we just scratch the surface. When we come to these prof profound portions of the Bible, we just scratch the surface. Imagine Jesus explaining Psalm 22, verse 16. Dogs have compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Imagine him breaking those things down forth. And when he came to Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Zechariah 30. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow. These were all prophetic utterances on events in the future, uttered and spoken by inspired men, but men who couldn't possibly know the suffering and the pain embedded in those portions of the Old Testament. Whereas, as Jesus to Cleopas and his friend through this sermon, he would have spoken in the past tense. That's all been done and dusted. 
And more significantly, he would have spoken from personal experience. Notice the words at the end of verse 27. Things concerning himself. That personal experience, my friends, would have added an authentic dimension to everything they heard. A dimension that preachers like myself can never add to the text of Scripture. So the preacher, walking alongside them here, he lived all this pain. He lived all the suffering. Ah, oh, little wonder. They wanted to hear more. Verse 29. They constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Oh, stay with us. Continue with us. Carry on preaching to us. And never was a guest more welcome in a home. Verse 29. He went in to tarry with them. And I believe that he didn't waste one minute of that time. He didn't go into this home for a keely. He went in to expound even more of the scriptures to them. And it was with grateful hearts that they offered him hospitality. In verse 30. He sat at meat with them and took bread, and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Now, despite the similarities between that and our communion warrant in 1 Corinthians 11, there's nothing sacramental here, I don't think. I think this is just ordinary thanksgiving for daily bread. But in any case, two significant things occurred here that are worthy of our attention. As he gave them this bread, verse 31, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. Now, to that point, they were, like Mary Magdalene at the grave, their eyesight was under divine constraint. Their eyes were holden. But now, as he handed over this bread, suddenly, they recognize him. They see him in all his glory, sitting with them in this home. And before they could even speak to him, before they could welcome him, before they could thank him, he's gone. He vanished. Verse 31, at the end, he vanished out of their sight. They could only give one response to it all. Verse 32. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? That, my friends, is the secret to enjoying a spiritual heart-burning experience. Seeing Jesus through eyes that have been opened by the Holy Spirit through having the Lord show himself to us in scriptures, in the word of his truth. But notice here, these two had their spiritual eyes opened. They saw him in all his beauty and in all his glory. But they never saw any wounds. Even now, with their eyes opened, they don't see any wounds in his hands. They don't see any wounds in his feet. All they saw was Jesus. And all they wanted to see was Jesus. All they heard was the word of his truth. And all they experienced was the outpouring of the love of God into their hearts. You remember when Blind Bartimaeus, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, when he was given his sight. Following a lifetime of blindness, when his eyes were opened by the miraculous power of Christ, he desired absolutely nothing 
but to see and to follow Jesus. That's all he wanted. To see and to follow Jesus. And there can be no greater blessing, my friends, in our own lives than having the word of God blessed to our hearts than seeing the glory of Jesus Christ when we turn the page of Scripture and having fellowship with him in his sufferings. And that's what makes believers eager to share that experience. We receive nothing, my friends, from our God to hold to ourselves. Everything he bestows upon us, we are to share as much as possible with others. So verse 33, they rose up, this always fascinates me, they rose up the same hour, remember, we're now into night time, yet they rose up the same hour and returned all the way to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed. We have something to tell you. This is the great news. This is what the world needs to hear. The Lord is risen indeed. That's the news you have to share with others. That's what you have to tell your families, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your very enemies. The Lord is risen indeed. The Lord of glory. The Lord who is able to have mercy upon your soul. The Lord who can love us with an everlasting love. And blessed be his holy name for that. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we thank thee for thy mercy, for thy grace, for thy spirit. We thank thee that we are able to believe in our risen Saviour this evening. A Saviour is able to open the eyes of the blind, a Saviour is able to bring the soul of man alive. A Saviour who can fill our hearts with hope, love and happiness. And may that be true of ourselves here this evening. That our hearts would burn with gratitude and with love for our beloved Saviour, for our wonderful God. Take us to our homes now in safety, for his name's sake. Amen. Let's start to receive the benediction. <laughs> now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>